All right, well, we will go ahead and get started. It looks like we've had quite a few people join and uh, we'll still have some continue to join over the next few minutes. But thank you everybody for joining today's webinar hosted by the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation. My name is Susan Hepworth and I serve as the foundation's executive director. Really pleased to be joined today by Dr. Jeffrey Kim, who's director of the Arrhythmia and Pacing Electrophysiology Service at Texas Children's Hospital. So after Dr. Kim gives his talk today, we have reserved time at the end just for question and answer from those who are attending today's webinar. So you'll see a couple of buttons at the bottom of your screen. We would encourage you to use either the chat box or the Q&A box to submit your question. And you don't need to hold them until the end of the presentation. Rather, as the questions come to your mind as Dr. Kim is speaking, go ahead and type those into the Q&A box or the chat box, and I will put them into the queue. And then once Dr. Kim is finished speaking, we'll just tick off all of those questions. So Dr. Kim, I'm gonna unshare my screen and then allow you to share yours, and then we go ahead and get started. Okay, let's hope this works. Looks great. Looks great, thank you. Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, attending this session and thank you to the Children's Cardiomyopathy Foundation for the invitation. I was asked to discuss the implications of exercise and competitive sports in children and young patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I think as everyone here knows, it's a very important point of discussion. Now I wanna start by really stating the obvious, and that is that this is always a very difficult decision for families, patients, and physicians alike. And there may not be a unified right or wrong choice. As you'll see, it's really dependent on many factors. And the goal is to share information, to share data, and to stimulate an informed choice. And many things have changed over the past decade. So we should be aware of what we know and what we still don't know. Having said that, it's a critical question, question that has significant implications. And I think it's always better to discuss and explore it rather than brush it under the rug, which is what we've had a tendency to do. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And to address this topic, I'm gonna to present a talk or a lecture and bring out what I know, what my views on, uh, on it are, and then open it up for questions. And I know that there are both parents, caretakers, as well as nurses and physicians on the line. So I'm gonna try to strike a balance with my approach to the groups. So if it seems like I'm talking to one side of the aisle, please bear with me. And uh, for the purpose of this lecture, I'm gonna propose this following outline, which we'll, we'll go through and discuss today. I wanna start, however, with a quick case vignette. And it's a patient that I took care of, care of and caused me to really start thinking about some of the aspects that we'll be talking about today. About 15 years ago, when I was a younger attending, a previously healthy 16-year-old boy presented for evaluation in my clinic with sporadic feelings of racing heartbeats while he was playing football. He was very active and fit. He was a starting running back for his high school varsity team as a sophomore. And he was a great student. He had mainly A's and B's in school. Based on his evaluation, which included my examination and testing, I grew increasingly suspicious that he had real cardiac disease. And he only had one question for me, and that was, can I keep playing football? And this was his ECG, or the electrocardiogram, when he came in. For those that aren't familiar with it, it gives us a good rhythm strip. And uh, the rhythm here was normal but he had big voltage. In other words, the uh, alignment of these lines are quite big. There's a lot of overlap in them. So that gives us a clue that something in the heart is bigger than it should be. And with that, I ordered an echocardiogram, which you'll probably all be familiar with. And this is an ultrasound of the heart. And here you can show and see that the middle of the heart, that area that we call the septum between the left and the right side of the pumping chambers is thick. That's where we usually see the thickness in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And with this, we did diagnose him with HCM. Due to this diagnosis and concern regarding the risk with sports and exercise and guideline recommendations at that time, he was restricted. And at one year follow-up, he was morbidly obese and had a BMI, which is our best measure of obesity of 41, which is quite high. 
He was struggling with grades in school. He was clinically depressed, required counseling and medications. But I told myself he was alive and I thought that was my primary job. Now, the question that I was left with and I've thought about quite a bit since then is, was that the best we could do for him? Are there other considerations and how can we best help patients and families continue to engage life with their diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we're gonna start with what we call guidelines. We have guidelines about sports, we have guidelines about participation, and there are several related to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Guidelines are where physicians usually start, although it's not the definitive say all, meaning that it's not the only part of the equation, it's an important data point. As you might expect, these have changed some over the years and rightfully so. A new guideline is released about every 10 years, and let's see how these have evolved or changed over time and where we stand today. Well, in 1985, the Bethesda Conference looked at some of this, and they essentially said, if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, common sense approach should be used, and they advised against participation in any competitive sport. So back then, if you had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, really, the recommendation was not to do anything. About 10 years later in 1994, they reconvened and then they modified it a little bit when they said, you can participate in all but low intensity sports. So most sports still restricted from, but they did open up what we call low intensity sports, which I'll show you in a second. And then 10 years later, the task force on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy reviewed it and it didn't really change. It said, again, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are advised against participation in all but low intensity sports. Then more recently, the AHA ACC guidelines in 2015, and these are the ones that most people are familiar with, they stated a couple of new things. One, participation in sports is reasonable if you have genotype positive, phenotype negative, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What that means is that if you have a gene that we know causes HCM, but you don't have any signs or evidence of disease yet, it's reasonable to play because your risk is still uh, thought to be low. They otherwise advised against participation in all but low intensity sports, again, similar to previous. And then they talked a little bit about uh, implantable defibrillator, which is something that can be implanted to shock someone out of a bad rhythm. And they said that it really shouldn't be used for the sole purpose of permitting participation. Now there are reasons to put one in and guidelines about that, but we shouldn't be putting in an ICD just so that you could play sports. So with this, you can see over 35 years, there were some small tweaks, but no real dramatic changes in progress. So our children were left with this, which is what it's defined as low intensity sports. And my kids will tell you that these aren't really sports that most kids are interested in anyways. Overall, at that point, I think everyone's gonna agree that the message was still quite restrictive, right or wrong. If you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you shouldn't be involved in any of the sports that kids consider meaningful. But we all know that exercise is good and sports participation has advantages. So what's the threshold and how much is too much? And can there be some degree of flexibility or individual responsibility in what we call shared decision-making? Based on this, and based on research that we'll see today, newer management guidelines came out last year. They finally evolved a bit and they came out a little bit early because a lot of this new data really suggested that maybe we should have a change in how we think about it. What they said primarily was that for most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mild to moderate intensity exercise is beneficial to improve fitness, quality of life and overall health. So they put in a recommendation that said exercise in general for HCM is important. They said for most patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, participation in low intensity competitive sports is reasonable, similar to what we saw before, and then stated that for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, participation in high intensity recreational activity or moderate to high intensity competitive sports may be considered after a comprehensive evaluation and shared discussion. So this is an important shift in paradigm. Before we moved from not playing at all to playing some minimal activities to now, based on your individual assessment, the possibility on a case-by-case -case basis of participating even in high-intensity sports. 
And when you take a step back, you can all see the progression of this recommendation scheme over time. In both the US and Europe, they moved from a recommendation of no participation at all to increasing tolerance and informed decision making to our current 2020 guidelines that we just looked at. To some, maybe that's enough. I know the guidelines and I don't really need to know anything else. I'm just gonna follow that. But I think most of us here are here to learn about the why behind the guidelines and the recommendations and to know, uh, and to know more about uh, what we need in terms of informed decision making. So what is the data surrounding these changes? How should we really approach this whole scheme? First off, what are we really worried about and why is this even an issue? And on top of this, how likely is it really to happen in my child or in my patient? Well, what we're worried about, and there's really no reason to beat around the bush, is sudden death. And the arrhythmias are abnormal rhythms that are really known to cause them. Because when you talk about sports participation, it's a balance. In these scenarios, we're asked to balance the acute risk of something bad happening, the risk of dying suddenly, along with the importance of exercise and the desire to participate. Again, we all know that exercise in sports can be good for you. And this can be important to families and kids in varying degrees. And lastly, the possible effect of exercise on the disease itself. Does exercise make hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy worse, or does it, make it maybe make it better? So we're balancing three elements, all of which have different priorities for individuals and families. Because the reality and what we have to start with is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has been a frequent cause of sudden death in the young. We know this. And historical studies that many of you have seen have consistently found that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a major player in sudden death in young, previously healthy people with undiagnosed disease, upwards of 30 to 40%. These are not specifically during sports, not specifically in athletes, but in general, we know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can lead to sudden death. And we know that this can happen in sports, which we've all seen the reports and stories and the societal implications when an athlete dies on the field, even beyond acute loss of life, are significant. So the reasons for starting with the conservative approach are well understood. We can't deny this, and for some, this risk is too high and outweighs any of the other considerations we're gonna talk about. If you say, I want zero risk of something bad happening during sports, then the com conversation really does stop there. And that's okay to some people, that's where they draw the line. But for many of us, it's important to understand this better and to evaluate the other side of the equation. Digging deeper, why do children with HCM die suddenly? What puts them at risk? Well, the reason that people with HCM do die suddenly is usually due to an abnormal rhythm, a sudden abnormal rhythm, what we call an arrhythmia, specifically an arrhythmia called ventricular tachycardia, which means fast heartbeats from the bottom chamber of the heart. And this is an example of a teenager with HCM that we follow where you can see was having bursts of ventricular tachycardia. And sometimes it could lock in, accelerate, and turn into something significantly more dangerous, which leads to sudden death. This is the rhythm that we're worried about. So how often does this happen? How often do we see ventricular tachycardia in our children? And beyond that, how often do we see it turning into actual sudden death? Not just population data, with undiagnosed disease like we've historically seen, but in patients that we know have HCM and that we are following in clinic, like many of your children, how often does this happen? Well, here I'm gonna start showing some data, the stuff behind the guidelines and the recommendations. And this is a recent big study that was just published six months ago. And it looked at some of these outcomes in children. They evaluated a pretty large group, 7,677 children, with known pediatric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They, look, they looked at what we call primary endpoints, the main things that we are trying to evaluate. And the three that they looked at were heart failure, meaning your heart pump starting to get worse, ventricular arrhythmia is what we're talking about, ventricular tachycardia, as well as all causes of death. They found that childhood onset hypertrophic cardiomyopathy had about a 2% per year overall event rate including all of those combined outcomes. So any of those events. Ventricular arrhythmias were, however, the most common event in that pediatric age group, especially in that first decade after diagnosis. And lastly, when you compare to adults with HCM, 
childhood onset HCM was more likely to develop some of these rhythms, so did do a little bit worse than our adult cohort. And here's the classic graph or figure that they showed looking at the rate of cardiac events over time. And what we're interested in and in talking about is that yellow line, the ventricular arrhythmias. And interestingly, the risk of that ventricular arrhythmia has been pretty constant over time. The rate is 0.7% per year. So you can say that in general, in all children with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is a 0.7% chance per year of having a ventricular arrhythmia. Again, this is not really during sports in particular, but overall in general. Also, although ventricular arrhythmias are what can lead to sudden death, not all ventricular arrhythmias result in sudden death. So do we know the rate of sudden death in HCM in this regard? Because that's ultimately what we really care about. And we have some data, although it's incomplete. In young adults, so this is uh, a little bit older than just young kids, but in young adults, the largest study shows a rate of sudden death about 0.5 to 1%. This makes sense based on what we just saw in terms of ventricular arrhythmias. In younger children, however, unfortunately, I think it's still less defined. We don't have a great number. There are several studies that have looked at this, but there's a lot of variability. The available studies show a rate of sudden death between 0.2 to 1.8% per year. So there's a range and a pretty wide range. We can say perhaps it's not super high, but it's real. And most of the recent data that we'll start seeing shows it's probably at the lower end of this. And that number range means different things to different people. Different patients and different families might consider it differently. Some of my families say 0.2% per year, the lower end is just too high. And then again, the balance stops there, but others find it low. And in the balance of other factors, this plays a critical role in that, in that decision-making. Additionally, although we're not gonna talk a lot about this for sake of time, because it's not really the point of the webinar, but I did want to mention the implantable cardioverter defibrillator, the ICD. And this is an implantable device like a pacemaker that can, again, shock you out of a bad rhythm, shock you out of that ventricular rhythm if you've had it. And these ICDs have been shown to be effective in preventing sudden death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with good real world outcomes. And it works and it can work as you see in this patient where their rhythm was shocked back to normal and which was uh, uh, something that could save someone's life. As we saw in the guidelines an ICD really shouldn't be placed for the sole reason of letting people play. It's not the reason that you could put people in sports, but an ICD is an important part of treatment algorithm. And again, something you should consider. Now, what are the other factors then? And what are other components of the balancing equation? Let's look briefly at physiology. What we mean by physiology is how the body reacts to exercise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is gonna go, again, just a little bit deeper. All those numbers we looked at are general numbers in the population, not specifically during sports or during exercise. So why the focus on sports? What happens to the heart with exercise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and why are we worried about exercise and sports in particular? Well, the concern is that obstruction might get worse in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and exercise. And this is a diagram of the heart. You can see blood as it comes in to the ventricle, the pumping chamber, and then goes out the aorta, which is where blood goes out to the body. And there is concern that if you exercise, that that level of obstruction, level of obstruction or blockage out the, of the heart might get worse. Additionally, acutely, there's concern that exercise can lead to dehydration, low body volume, what we call hypovolemia, electrolyte abnormalities, so the salt in your body gets off. And then along with adrenaline that we know happens during sports could result in some of these bad rhythms that we were just talking about. Also, there's been concern that long-term repeated exercise, meaning long-term over time in athletes maybe there's detrimental or bad effects on the disease due to strain on the heart, that it could make the disease worse over time. And the question is, does this really happen? Is this true? Well, newer understanding of what happens to the heart has evolved based on growing data. And when you look at athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, specifically those involved in intense athletics and high levels of exercise, they tend to have milder disease. They have less thickness, so less hypertrophy, 
they have less obstruction, so less blockage of blood flow out. They have better function and no increase in scar over time. In other words, they have favorable or good long-term parameters, better than what we were suggesting in terms of our hypothesis. So they don't get worse. And it looks like maybe it's possible that those that exercise actually get better. And if you look even at animal studies in mice with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and yes, we have several uh, animal models, including mice with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but even with a short period of training, training these mice for two to six minutes per day, there's decrease in hypertrophy, decrease in disarray, meaning de decrease in disorganization, it looks more normal, and decrease in scar overall, pointing again towards maybe long-term there are benefits of exercise, and maybe exercise makes physiology of the heart better in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Lastly, and in that light, what we're talking about today, is there something that we call the paradox of risk in exercise? Remember, we're talking about sudden death, and what is the paradox of risk? Well, in other diseases, like coronary artery disease, heart failure or congenital heart disease, meaning children born with structural heart disease, there may initially be an increased risk with sudden death in exercise, but long-term, the favorable or good changes from exercise that we just talked about reduces that risk over time. It might become protective. In other words, the risk that we know is there and we can't deny may become less over time if you have good changes that come with fitness and exercise. The question is, could this be true with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? And I'm not saying that we know that this is true yet. This hasn't really been explored in HCM, but in other diseases it has. And is it possible that HCM will follow a similar kind of line? Then moving on, what's some of the newer evidence? How has our understanding evolved recently? And what are other considerations we should take in when we discuss informed decision-making? Well, first off, we know that not everyone is the same. Some children with HCM do have higher risk for sudden death than others. So those general numbers we've been talking about, not only is there a range overall, but it's variable person to person. Is there a better way to predict which kids have the greatest risk? And this is a critical question. And we now have several studies in children in that regards that have looked at risk factors and several risk factors have been identified perhaps factors that we should take into account when we talk about sports and participation in athletics. These high-risk factors include the history of previous cardiac arrest. So if someone had a history of having something bad happen already, they fall into a high-risk group. Degree of hypertrophy, meaning if you have really thick or really hypertrophy ventricles in HCM, unexplained syncope or a history of unexplained passing out with exercise, non-sustained episodes of these ventricular arrhythmias. So documentation, as you followed up, documentation that these arrhythms do exist. A lot of scar in your heart when you get an MRI or evaluation, or a lot of obstruction to blood flow. These in general have been shown to be high-risk factors. And if our children have one of these high-risk factors, maybe we consider sports differently because the risk might be higher. Now, this is something that I think parents should bring up to their physicians when you're talking about sports. Does my child have one of these high risk factors and does it tilt our conversation in a different way? Unfortunately, all these studies really evaluate risk at baseline again. None of them are really looking during sports, but they are considerations to discuss when you talk about development. This brings us back to acute risk with sports. We've talked about general population data, but what is the risk in athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the current era? And have we been able to better define this over time? Well, recent data suggests that the overall rate of cardiac arrest during sports, meaning in athletes with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, may be lower than previously thought. In a Canadian database, something we call the Rescue Cardiac Arrest Database, it looked at competitive athletes over 18.5 million athlete years. So that's a long, period of time with a lot of data. And the rate of sudden death during sports was 0 0.76 per 100,000 athlete years, so pretty low. And there were only two deaths attributed to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in over 10 years in the Canadian experience. In a prospective multinational registry of patients with defibrillators that participated in competitive sports. So this is higher risk patients who've already been thought to be 
high risk and thus had a defibrillator, a defibrillator play. 65 of these with HCM. So they're not all HCM, but 65 with. There were no deaths, no cardiac arrests, and one shot during exercise. And so there are, are some events, there is some risk, but overarchingly in this group, it seemed to be low. And specifically looking at recent observational data in athletes with HCM, the estimated risk of cardiac arrest during competitive sports keeps pushing lower, probably around 0.1 to 0.3% per year. So not zero, but maybe lower than previously thought. Again, that risk means different things to different people and how it plays a role in the balance is different family to family. They're starting to have more focused studies specifically looking at sports with HCM. And then in this recent study, it looked at athletes with known hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they were followed for many years. When they were diagnosed, they were uh, given the choice. You could continue to play your competitive sport or you can pull out and be restricted. And when they followed them over time for many years, there was really no difference in the rate of events, meaning arrhythmias or sudden deaths between those who stopped playing and those who continued to play at high level athletics. And that top line there is really those that continue to play sports. And the bottom line is those who decided to stop. And you can see that the rate of events, if anything, is a little bit better in those who continue to play. Importantly, the majority of the events when they did happen occurred at rest and not with exercise. Another broader study looked at 366 competitive athletes with high risk disease. 23 of these were hypertrophs, so not all, again, a small part of them were hypertrophs here. And the average age was 15, so mostly teenagers. They compared those who continued to play sports, competitive athletics, versus, again, those who decided to stop. And in this group, bad events meaning having cardiac arrest or dying suddenly was less frequent in those who continued to play sports. And events predominantly occurred again outside of sports. And if you look at other data in young people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we know that 85% of events occur at rest or with light activity, suggesting that it might be misguided to really be focusing on sports alone. It's not that events don't happen, they can happen with sports, but usually when events happen in HCM, it's still with rest or not with competitive athletics. Outside of acute risk then, what about the benefits of exercise? We know that exercise in general is good for you. First, we're learning that exercise does improve fitness in HCM and can make you better. This is a large study called the RESET hypertrophic cardiomyopathy study. It was a randomized trial to determine if uh, moderate intensity exercise, meaning cycling, jogging, or an elliptical, for 16 weeks improved exercise capacity in patients with HCM. First, it showed that patients with HCM safely engaged in this moderate intensity exercise. There were no deaths, no cardiac arrest, uh, or ICD shots, or sustained ventricular arrhythmias. And those who exercised had an improved quality uh, of life, an improved qualitative assessment of health. Also after exercise, there was a modest but significant improvement or increase in exercise capacity. This is a measurement of something we call VO2, and that's a, a objective measurement of how fit you are. And you can see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, exercise improves your fitness. Exercise is important for patients with HCM, just like it is for everyone else. And several other studies have shown the same positive long-term response to exercise in HCM. Moderate exercise, results in improved function and quality of life with decreased arrhythmias and no effect on adverse events. Even high intensity exercise resulted, resulted in improved heart dimensions, decreased hypertrophy, improved cardiac function, in other words, improved heart function, improved fitness, and no worsening of disease events. So long-term effects on cardiovascular fitness and outcomes have been favorable in hypertrophs who are involved in exercise and sports, and this data is really why those new recommendations said that exercise in HCM is important and recommended. Now, what about detriments or the bad consequences of restrictions? What's the flip side if we force all kids not to exercise or play sports? Well, there are data to show that children with HCM, HCM are just as susceptible to the sequelae of inactivity as the rest of us. A third of children with diagnosis of HCM are either overweight or obese, and obesity, we know, promotes worsening disease in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
they're more likely to have increased LV mass. In other words, those that are obese with HCM are known to have increased hypertrophy and have thicker hearts, and they are more likely to have obstruction due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So those that are obese are more obstructed than those that are less obese. Now you take that into adulthood as people grow older, and data show us that in adults, obesity is directly associated with long-term survival and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In this large adult study, obesity was again quite common, 39% being pre-obese, 32% being obese, only 29% had normal BMIs. In other words, were normal and not obese. Many patients reported that they do not exercise due to restrictions. Patients with obesity were more likely to have symptoms. They were more likely to be obstructed in terms of blood flow out the heart. And they were more likely to have adverse events and heart failure. So they did worse. And on analysis, those with a higher BMI, meaning a higher level of obesity, had lower survival. And these two graphs show that. The highest obesity are the ones at the bottom, those blue lines. And you can see that they had worse survival than the top line, which had normal BMIs and weren't obese. Uh, so BMI does matter, obesity does matter, and we don't want our children to be growing into unfit, obese adults with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we know clearly that data suggests that it's bad for them. In survey data, over 50% of adults with HCM now don't participate in recommended minimal amounts of exercise or physical activity. So this is not talking about sports, but it's just saying the minimal amounts that the American Heart Association recommends. And over 50% of adults with HCM don't even do that. And they say the reasons why are, I've been advised not to exercise all my life. My disease stops me. My health is not good enough. I might damage my health and I feel unsafe to exercise. And so clearly the recommendations that we made years ago have uh, impact on long-term effects in adults with HCM. Here's another variable to consider. Looking at evaluations focused on children, it's been found to be true that children with HCM have significantly reduced quality of life and poor psychosocial adjustment in comparison to their peers. Additionally, surveys show that this poor adjustment in childhood is primarily related to anxiety and inability to be involved in activities and sports. In other words, the restrictions that we've been placing on them. Although it's not the only factor, it is a major factor. And along those lines, in a recent survey of 54 young uh, previous childhood athletes with HCM who were restricted from sports, per our recommendations, 56% reported depression or sadness, 50% reported fear, anxiety about activity, 32% reported loss of self-confidence, and 75% said they remain unable to find healthy coping mechanisms for their disease. So exercise and sports have had have an important upside. And this balance that we talked about in the beginning is something where we have to consider all of these factors. We can't divine this balance for people. People have a different balance of what's important and it's personal, but these are factors that we have to consider. So then what would I recommend or how do I approach my patients about this? Well, first off in general, when assessing the balance in our approach to exercise and sports in HCM, I do think the new and evolved guidelines are appropriate in stating that participation should be considered on an individual basis after a comprehensive evaluation of their disease characteristics and risk, meaning everyone is different. And I'm convinced that we shouldn't be universally restricting everyone anymore, just like I'm convinced that we shouldn't be allowing everyone to play. There's a balance based on the individual evaluation. And I would advocate, like this recent publication did, that patients with HCM can and should participate freely in light and moderate exercise with a guided approach. We know that exercise is important for them and we should be letting children with HCM exercise. And that even more vigorous ex uh, exercise and competitive athletics can be considered in select non-high-risk patients with HCM in a model of what we call, call shared decision-making. All patients and all these factors should be discussed with the doctor and the team. To be clear, I don't think we should be universally clearing all patients for sports. They're clearly high-risk patients, but we need a more rounded impression and decisions should be made together with patients and families in the context of their priorities in life. As mentioned, 
and all over the guidelines that we see now is this concept of shared decision making. And this is very important. On the left, you see what our traditional view was, this unidirectional research centered view where we would look at the data and we would see you in clinic and say, yes, no, you can play or you can't. That's not the scheme that we're talking about currently. The new bi-directional approach, the patient-centered approach, uh, calls for education, information, empowerment in terms of partnership, and the patient or family-centric discussion of endpoints. If you look way at the right, you see that evidence-based medicine, some of what I tried to share with you today, and the patient preferences, all the other factors there overlap and lead to this shared decision-making model which really is the primary factor in the decision of whether or not you should play sports or not. It's an overlap of the data that we looked at and the individual preferences of the patient and family. Now I need to bring up another very, very important point because we know that we can't prevent all events from happening. When we allow our patients or our children to participate, we have to also make sure that there's an action plan in place. If the undesired happens, there needs to be a clear response plan. And it's the responsibility of the physician, the school, and the family to make sure that a plan's in place. We do this for all of our patients who want to participate and have a disease that might put them at risk. So an action plan is critical. And I need to emphasize that despite what decisions are made in terms of participation, I never let patients play without discussing the plan in case the worst case scenario happens. And this is where schools also have to get involved. So we do need to have an action plan. With that, however, in contrast to the patient story I shared at the beginning of this talk, here's an example of a patient we care for who was diagnosed with HCM recently due to an abnormal ECG in early high school. And this patient was also diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and was initially restricted, restricted after comprehensive assessment and shared decision-making, discussions related to risks and family context like we just looked at. She was allowed to continue swimming and she placed third in state. And then she signed with Arkansas on a scholarship. So there are cases in this paradigm where successful high level participations is possible and they're achievable and they can be very meaningful for patients and families if this is a big priority for them. With that, I would conclude with the fact that patients with HCM do have a risk of, experience of experiencing ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death with or without exercise. So we can't brush that under the rug. There is a risk of having sudden death. The extent, if any, that exercise or sports participation increases this risk, however, remains incompletely known and is likely lower than previously suspected. There is no evidence that vigorous exercise worsens HCM, in other words, that makes the disease worse, but rather evidence is starting to point that there might be favorable effects and that exercise is good for you. The positive benefits of exercise and sports participation, as well as the potential detrimental or negative effects of activity restrictions are well described and shared decision-making based on informed discussions on case-by-case -case basis remains important. The physician's role should transition from a disqualifier to an educator and guide, and an action plan with readiness for events remains critical as a point and a piece of the pie. Thank you all for your time. I know it's a very complex thing, uh, and uh, uh, as we discussed, it's a very individual thing, but I do want to open up the floor for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, and you can go ahead and unshare your screen. And we've gotten quite a few questions in already. So just a reminder to everybody to throw those in the Q&A box. And so we will start ticking through those. So uh, Dr. Kim, let's start with this. You mentioned that the traditional risk factors for sudden cardiac death in HCM are not necessarily during exercise. My understanding is that many of these factors do not accurately predict risk of arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death during exercise, and it's difficult to really risk stratify an individual person. How do you convey this uncertainty to your patients? And specifically, the difficulty of how we can't reliably risk stratify their risk of arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death with high intensity exercise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, that nuance was picked up on. Uh, because the reality is that most of our data on risk is just general in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I think most practitioners would say that those risks 
whether they're at rest or during exercise probably do play a role across the gamut, but they aren't risk factors that are specifically looked at in exercise. And like I said, the specific risk with exercise is evolving. There are a lot of small studies that suggest that patients uh, can participate in sports and they uh, can do well with it, but it would be hard for someone to be able to say, I know the exact percentage. I think overall, if you are a low risk hypertroph, meaning you don't have some of those high risk factors we saw, that participation in sports is not real high in terms of that risk. We saw that range in general, but um, the definitive absolute number still isn't, isn't well known. And that, that range means different things to people. So when I talk to patients, I'm pretty clear about that. And I say, in general, what I feel the range of risk is, but that we don't know for sure. And for some families, that amount of risk, that 0 0.2, 0.3% risk per year is too high. And then when you balance it with those other factors, they say it's not worth it. But for many people, that general range risk, when you uh, weigh it with the other factors, and if sports is really a big important part for the child and the family, say that that risk is acceptable. Um, but, but you're right, there's no perfect percentage. And as of now, we're heading there, but as of now, we don't really have a great risk stratifier for during sports. Okay, got a few questions from parents here. Um, my seven-year-old has a severe HCM and had a heart failure playing tag in school. They installed a pacemaker defibrillator next to the liver, a low weight child. What kind of mild sports can we propose to him not to increase his risk? It's the definition of the various sports levels that we are not understanding. Yeah, also a very good question. And um, some of those definitions have been defined. I didn't show the chart, but I showed that little clip of what we call low intensity sport that just talks about sports, but not exercise. Uh, I think in general, there's two factors uh, for your son. One is the defibrillator. The defibrillator in general has been proven to be okay and safe in most activities in sports, but there are some contact related things that you would not want him to do. Because what you don't want to do is break the defibrillator where it wouldn't work and uh, he needs other procedures. So things that are high risk for trauma, even if they're lower aerobic risk, like things where there's a lot of collision and those kinds of things, I think are the ones that from a defibrillator standpoint, you want to avoid, so contact sports. In relation to just the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, meaning taking the defibrillator out of that picture, uh, he's probably proven that his risk factor is a little bit higher than the general population, given that he's had an event or something happened there. And so it is someone that we would be more careful about the higher intensity things, but we know that exercise in general is important and light intensity guided exercise usually means that you ramp that up with discussion of the physician, which means generally starting with walking and jogging and participation in general kid related activities are normal, where it becomes a little bit more complex is when you get to middle school and high school and you talk about the intensity level of sports. And that's where some of the guidelines do have that delineated for you. Again, the low intensity sports really talk about things like golf and, um, and those related issues, but, but those are published, which we can, we can share with you through the CCF if you'd like those. Great, thank you. All right, uh, this person says, thank you so much for this talk. My son has an ICD after cardiac arrest four years ago. He has done well. At that time, genetic testing was inconclusive. At what point do you recommend repeat testing? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question, and it depends a little bit on the breadth of the panel that was sent. As you know, and as you're alluding to, there's several genes that can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's not perfect. Meaning, even in the current era, we may have you know 60, 70 percent yield of saying, "I know you have disease, and it sounds like uh, your child does have disease," but we won't find a known gene for it. And it doesn't mean that you don't have disease. We're just not smart enough to know exactly what the gene is. The time frame for that uh, varies a bit. The panels do expand based on discovery. And in general, every several years, you may have a new gene added to it. So what I'd recommend is um, looking with your physician at the panel that's there, meaning what genes were sent for, what new genes have been added to the panel, and what percentage that increases the yield. And if it's worth uh, expanding that panel, a lot of the genetic testing companies will cover that kind of expansion. 
At the same time, the other factor related to that is even the genes that we know, sometimes you come up with something we call a variant of undetermined significance, which means there is a change in the DNA that we don't know really what it means. That should be reviewed and reevaluated. Uh, we do that at every visit. So if you came back for your yearly visit, we would look through your genetic testing and say, we've looked a little bit more at this variant and it may lean one way or another, but it depends a little bit on what the genes were sent for. Uh, we would review that test every year and then decide on whether or not an expansion is reasonable. There hasn't been a lot that's changed in the last few years. So if it was four years ago, I think probably you won't get a huge increase in yield from expanding it. But I do think that as years go on, you would revisit that. Okay. A couple more questions here. If patients have no LVOT at rest, do you use stress echo to assess the presence of obstruction with exercise? Also an excellent question because it sounds like you've looked at some of the old data. The reality is that a lot of that has changed over time. Obstruction with exercise used to be one of the big criteria in terms of looking at risk, uh, including uh, at risk with exercise. Even here at Texas Children's, we looked at uh, a while back and it looked like increasing obstruction with exercise may play out uh, as a risk factor in terms of having sudden death for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But most of the recent studies, the bigger ones from 2018 to 2020, have found that that level of obstruction um, isn't as big of a factor in terms of risk as some of the other factors. So I think it's probably a factor that you have to consider, but the amount that you would put weight on that um, isn't as big as, as we once thought. And so uh, we used to run all of our hypertrophs on a treadmill pretty regularly for what we call risk assessment. Uh, we don't do that as regularly now. And so uh, depending on the scenario and other risk factors, we might, but not kind of a universal kind of thing. So we don't uh, repeatedly run people to measure how that gradient is changing. Okay. All right, uh, this question comes from Brittany, who's actually one of our parent ambassadors at the foundation. My son has a double mutation of the MYBPC3 gene. Does that make a difference or impact differently with physical activity? Um, we don't really have data on that. Uh, and it's an excellent question, whether it's a double hit or the specific gene, for example. There's some people and, um, you guys are probably picking up on that there's a lot of variability still, but uh, there are some people in some worlds where specific mutations harbor increased risk for having arrhythmias. So there are some studies that talk about troponin mutations, one of the mutations that are rarer but can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that those children have a higher risk for ventricular arrhythmias, again, in general, not related to sports. There's nothing that really has looked at gene related to sports. Um, but I, I, I would have to say, I don't have a great answer to that question, whether or not there's increased risk from uh, a double hit or two mutation kind of thing. I think you would more lay on the physical um, findings, you know, the other factors that have been well studied at that point. Okay, a few more questions. My son just turned seven and over the past three years, his activity level has declined. He tires more quickly now than before. He received an ICD when he was a year old due to passing out twice. Would exercising worsen or possibly help him? Um, I think exercise in general is seen to be good in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so again, exercise is uh, on a spectrum of how intense you go, obviously. But uh, I think when you talk about people getting older and it's, it's very difficult as, uh, especially as you get older into the teen years, sometimes you have children that just don't wanna do a lot of things. So what I would say in terms of just kind of splitting yes, no, is that general exercise and fitness is something I would recommend for all children, including children with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so, you know, if there's a component of fatigue, I think uh, 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 guided fitness and exercise along with your physician is gonna be important. Based on risk factors, and again, it sounds like yeah, uh, your child may have some of the higher risk factors given the defibrillator, the extent of exercise, may be modulated, and that's why they talk about guided exercise, but that's something that I would really discuss with your physician in there, but exercise in general, I think I would encourage that it, it is important. The other factor with fatigue is, um, you know, you want to make sure that there aren't other things that are there 
Uh, sometimes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, usually as you get older, does lead to heart failure as it burns out. And so if there are other reasons from the heart, like his heart function is worse, then there may be other reasons to intervene in other ways. Uh, but in general, I do think that fitness uh, is, is going to remain important. Okay. Any comments on beta blockers and HCM and exercise? Great question. That is actually another point that is put out in the guideline recommendations where I didn't put it up in our snippets. There's a lot more in there than the, the few that I picked out. Uh, and so beta blockers in general may be important for the treatment of HCM because as you know, slowing the heart can increase filling of the heart and decrease that obstruction that we talked about. Beta blockers can also decrease the risk of some of these abnormal rhythms coming out. But uh, associating beta blockers specifically in treatment with exercise hasn't really been looked at. And the guidelines say that just like with a defibrillator, medications, whether it's a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker or disopyramide, medications shouldn't change your um, uh, approach to clearing patients to play sports or participate in activities. So they're important in the paradigm of treating HCM, but in the current guidelines, they don't really change whether or not you clear somebody or not. Okay. This question says, my son is G positive, P negative. My brother is the same, but my sister, dad, and myself are P positive. What are your thoughts about his approaching puberty and risk factors? When he mm -hmm. plays sports, should he be monitoring heart rate as he continues to play sports or should we be monitoring something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you'd be monitoring is for development of uh, phenotypic, so P is, is phenotype, meaning evidence of disease, you're going to be monitoring for development of evidence of disease. And even in uh, individual families, the progression or the time that that might develop is, is different. Uh, puberty uh, is a time where sometimes you see this come out and accelerate. So as you're suggesting, it's a time where you're going to watch for that closely because most of the data is going to tell you that genotype positive, phenotype negative, like um, the two in your family you're talking about G positive, P negative, have low risk from participating in sports and exercise. They don't have any signs of disease yet. And so uh, the guidelines would suggest that it's reasonable for them to continue to play, but you would want them to be monitored for the development or signs of disease that would flip them from G positive, P negative to G positive, P positive. In other words, they're gonna, if they develop that phenotype, so here, once you're in the teenage years, we look at uh, patients yearly uh, for family screening and seeing if there is development of phenotype. If that happened, then you would really swing into that uh, other degree of recommendation based on phenotype. I personally wouldn't put the heart monitor on uh, during exercise. I think there's a good chance of um, increased anxiety and false positives and monitoring a lot of those things. But I think I would be uh, watching for development of so in your visits, doing echocardiograms and evaluating and looking to see if, if phenotype is developing. Okay. So I think we'll probably just ask one or two more questions. And we have gotten a lot of others that are just kind of comments. Thanking you so much for your talk. A couple of people have just talked about they're worried about, you know, the psychological effects of the restrictions on their children to be able to participate in athletics. Um, here's a question. What are your thoughts on the newly developed medicine that is said to soften the heart muscle and dramatically reduce HCM symptoms? Is this something that should be considered in the future? And will this affect the feasibility of participation in um, higher rated activity? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the answer to that is I don't know. There are a couple of uh, ongoing studies uh, regarding medications and early intervention for development of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, meaning can you treat people that you know have a gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with various medicines that slow the progression and change phenotype uh, from coming out or getting worse, as well as some medicines if you have an element of stiffness of the heart what we call diastolic function, where you can improve some of that diastology. And so I think uh, we're gonna start to see whether it changes the progression of disease. Those, those studies are ongoing mainly uh, in older people with HCM, but I think all um, diseases where we know a gene, the question of early intervention with medicines and um, softening or decreasing progression of disease are gonna be ongoing. They're not gonna be coming out anytime 
uh, in the next year or so. So you're talking about a little bit of a longer term evaluation, but, but those will be uh, uh, ongoing. Whether or not that changes uh, risk with high intensity sports, I don't really know. I, I still would pin it on the phenotype. And so if these medicines change the phenotype, meaning the um, parameters of the disease and how it's presenting, then that probably does have an effect on risk factors. Uh, but it would be based more on those kind of measurables than anything else at this point. Okay. Well, Dr. Kim, thank you so much. This was a fabulous presentation, a lot of good engagement from our audience. I've received several inquiries. We will definitely be sending out a recording of this webinar via email, so probably expect that next week. And then I'm going to also follow up with Dr. Kim. We've had a couple people ask for links to some of the specific studies that you cited in that presentation, so we'll try to include some of that information in the follow-up email. We want to thank everybody for joining us today, and thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.